We're honored to have with us here today, um, Natasha Hostoff. Natasha Hostoff is a wonderful, wonderful barrister, as they say in England, and the head of UK Lawyers for Israel. Natasha um, is an attorney in London who holds law degrees from Oxford and Tel Aviv universities and was a fellow in the National Security Program at Columbia Law School, where I went to school. Natasha previously worked for Skadden Arps in London and Brussels and clerked for the president of the Israel Supreme Court, Justice um, Miriam Naor in Jerusalem. Um, and she is frequently um, appearing on international media and discusses international law, foreign affairs, and national security policy on television and throughout the print and visual media. First of all, Natasha, welcome. It's really an honor and a privilege to have you. Um, before we begin, can you tell us a bit about the concept of proportionality in armed conflict? I can certainly, Sarah, uh, and thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. My, my deep apologies. I was a few minutes late. It's a, it's a hazard of of the profession, unfortunately, and I have run straight from court. Um, I I'm very grateful also for the promotion, uh, but I I should perhaps uh, clarify that UK Lawyers for Israel is an organisation I've been involved in for over ten years uh, as a volunteer, and I'm very privileged to serve as the legal director of our charitable trust arm. Um, but we have a, a wonderful CEO uh, in Jonathan Turner, who has made this organization uh, really a force to be reckoned with. Um, and the length of uh, victories, not all of which are, I'm afraid, uh, public, but some of which are um, included in the website and uh, news articles and, and brochures in terms of achievement. So um, I'm very privileged uh, to continue to serve in a, in a voluntary capacity and, and assist those efforts. Um, and no more, uh, perhaps, is, is that work uh, more desperately needed than in the context of the misrepresentations of international law that we have been seeing, and in particular, this concept of proportionality. Um, proportionality in international law of armed conflict or humanitarian law uh, has a very specific meaning. Uh, however, uh, especially over the last couple of months, we've been seeing um, a misrepresentation of what proportionality means. And in many cases, it's presented as a sort of comparison of body counts. Um, the, the grotesque consequence of that sort of analysis uh, must be that, uh, and, and many people seem to have embraced uh, this approach, not a su sufficient number of Israelis have died to merit Israel's response. Now, that is reprehensible, uh, but it is uh, wrong in law. It is, is also wrong in, in logic. Um, there is, I think, as a matter of common sense, a problem with saying that one has to reciprocate um, in, a, in a similar manner uh, against uh, an enemy, a, a foe, uh, no matter how uh, reprehensible the atrocities committed that uh, by that foe might be. And um, th that concept was perhaps put most forcefully uh, in recent months by Douglas Murray. Um, and I know his uh, his uh, his challenge to to that concept, that very, very flawed concept of proportionality um went viral. Um, the problem, I think, is with with rejecting uh, the proportionality on the basis of of that assessment of a comparison of casualty figures um is that it, it causes many to, reject the the principle of proportionality outright um and, and that is difficult uh, and problematic because a principle of proportionality does exist in international law and it's important that we recognize what that is uh, because that will enable us to recognize that israel not only complies with that principle of proportionality but the measures that israel takes in striving to uphold that principle as uh, with other uh, aspects of the law of armed, for, uh, of armed conflict, um, are really second to none. Israel, and this is in respect of, of the unprecedented challenges that it is facing in its conflict with Palestinian terror groups, um, but Israel has responded to that by developing innovative practices uh, and specialist uh, targeted uh, munitions in order to ensure that the principle of proportionality is complied with. 
Now, with that trailer, um, what it means in international law is that a reasonable military commander needs to make an assessment. And that assessment uh, is conducted on a strike by strike basis. And it involves a balance, a balance between the military necessity and the military objective that a strike is aimed at achieving. And that has to be balanced against the anticipated collateral damage. So that is damage to civilians and civilian objects that is foreseen. Critically, this is an analysis of intent. It is not an effects-based analysis. So we will all, of course, recognize the awful pictures coming out of Gaza uh, Mm -hmm. and circulating. And there is undoubtedly uh, destruction of uh, what Israel has been targeting in terms of terror infrastructure. And it is plain that that terror infrastructure has embedded itself in uh, civilian buildings, in residential areas, uh, and in the close vicinity of protected buildings. We'll come on, I'm sure, to talk about hospitals. We have uh, instances also of UNRWA clinics, of UN schools. Uh, So civilian protected buildings being provided uh, as, as cover uh, for the Hamas terror infrastructure. In that context, uh, the proportionality principle applies according to what the army expects and anticipates in terms of a strike against an individual target. Uh, and that is informed by the intelligence that the Israeli Defense Forces have. Uh, and the assessment is made. Now, there is a track record that Israel has with respect to the application of international law and specifically the principle of proportionality. And this has been analysed through previous conflicts uh, by um, high-level military officials, uh, including those involved in the high-level military group who've published a number of reports. And Israel's conduct throughout these operations in Gaza, so from Castle Ed in 2008, all the way uh, to the present day Iron Swords operation, um, the analysis has been consistent. And that is uh, with respect to the precautions and the measures that Israel takes, but also importantly, with respect to the involvement of army lawyers. Now, the Military Advocate General Corps sits outside the chain of command. Uh, They are answerable, the army lawyers, to the attorney general, not the chief of staff. And that is important because frequently they will have to make calls on strikes. And it may be that the commanders uh, decide that, you know, that there is an important military imperative to conduct a strike. But it is up to the lawyers uh, to help that commander uh, make the assessment of proportionality. And they do so on the basis of the information that they have uh, about uh, civilians on, on the ground. So uh, there are um, determinations that are being made, um, according to what you just relayed, um, by the Attorney General. And um, at what point um, does a general determine that this is this strike um, is proportional to the military objective, um, and does the eternal general have the ultimate say to say no? You cannot. You cannot attack this certain structure or building. Well, I need to clarify that these targeting decisions are, are taken on a on a strike by strike basis, much lower down the, the chain. Um, but the involvement of lawyers in that process, um, mm-hmm. I would argue, is unprecedented in terms of law abiding militaries around the world. Uh, absolutely, you know, the British Army, the American Army, um, it, it, it employs deploys legal experts and analysis when it is conducting its operations. Uh, but the very very close involvement uh, that law Always have vis-a-vis the IDF is is unusual to say the least. Um, ultimately, however, I think it's also important to stress that law provides a basic level, a basic uh, standard, um, and the law of armed conflict recognizes that even law-abiding armies and soldiers will inevitably partake in pretty horrific scenes. The expectation is that civilians will die as a matter of collateral damage. And I think in that context, it's important to stress that 
my experience of of engaging uh, with both those commanders making decisions and the lawyers informing them uh, has given me the consistent impression that the military commanders in the field uh, have to conduct a an assessment that is even uh, over and above the legal one, and that is a moral one. Uh, and that is informed by the IDF's Code of Ethics, Code of Arms, uh, and the, by the uh, moral ethical code mm -hmm. that they adhere to. Uh, and when one considers the balancing uh, act, the balancing equation, there are no hard and fast rules. It is ultimately the responsibility of the commander in the field. And that is a responsibility that is taken very seriously. It is no tall, uh, it, will, uh, it is no short order, I should say, uh, for uh, a military commander to, to, to have to make that sort of decision, especially where uh, collateral damage is concerned. Uh, and so it will depend on the facts and the circumstances of each instance. Uh, but to enable that balance to be properly struck and to reduce the number of civilian casualties as much as possible, the IDF uh, takes certain measures. I'm sure many in the audience will be familiar with them. They involve warning uh, civilians of in, uh, impending strikes. And that, of course, has the effect of also warning the enemy of uh, telling Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad where the IDF will be striking. But those warnings take the form of leaflets that are dropped uh, from planes uh, and drones. They take the form of phone calls to individual householders, text messages. Those warnings also take the form of a, a technique developed um, by Israel called knock on roof, which is a, a loud bang onto the roof of a building which is about to be targeted uh, with a strike. And that is a final warning to enable any remaining uh, civilians uh, to have that last opportunity to, to leave. And it's interesting to note, I think, the number of videos that we have from on the ground in Gaza uh, of buildings being destroyed by the Israeli Defense Forces. And uh, it is a matter of common sense, of course, it, it, it is understandable that the reason the camera is up and running uh, and able to capture uh, the strike as and when it happens is because of these warnings and often because of knock on roof, uh, which has occurred uh, pretty imminently before uh, the strike is conducted. So all of that is taken into account um, and is... Uh, deployed for, for two real reasons. Well, one, of course, is to comply with another key principle of the law of armed conflict, which is the principle of precaution, and to do everything possible to reduce uh, the likelihood of civilian casualties. But it also enables uh, Israel to better strike that balance as part of proportionality and to prosecute its military objectives properly. Because if we step back for a moment and contemplate what it is that so many people who misrepresent this principle of proportionality are actually asking Israel to do, they are asking the IDF to afford immunity to Hamas while they operate uh, from within civilian areas and while they use civilians as human shields. And all of Israel's efforts over the last two months in terms of encouraging and assisting civilians to evacuate to the south of Gaza and now out of Khan Yunus uh, is to um, prevent Hamas from achieving that sort of victory, immunizing itself uh, from lawful, legitimate uh, military strikes against it by holding those uh, civilians, and these are Gazan civilians hostage, as well as, of course, the Israeli civilians that it has so brutally uh, abducted. Um, and, and that is, I, I think, something that we need to be forcefully uh, putting forward, that not only as a matter of law is this utterly uh, um, unintelligible and illiterate, uh, but also as a matter of common sense, what is being called for uh, is a carte blanche for terror organizations. And, and that principle, um, that precedent won't stop with Israel. Uh, it will ultimately bind all law-abiding states 
in seeking to uh, combat this sort of terrorism and these unscrupulous individuals who use civilians as human shields. I note that in terms of the coalition forces' um, activities against uh, ISIS and, and Mosul, these arguments were not being put forward. And that is because they are illogical. Uh, they do not enable uh, legitimate military uh, might to be used to counter terrorist forces, and they are as illegitimate uh, in this case vis-a-vis -vis Hamas as they would have been against ISIS also. Excellent. Um, could you speak about, first of all, the <coughs> primary responsibility of a government um, to protect its civilian population, and where is that in international law? Um, that's a very good question. I, I, I would probably fall back on, uh, you know, it's a matter of customary in international law. It's it's so obvious um, that it doesn't require stating that the the acknowledgement, perhaps, in Article 51 of the UN Charter of the inherent right of states to self-defence is a reflection of that. Um, I, I note that, that there's nothing in international law which bestows that right on states. It is simply recognised as being inherent uh, because it is, uh, I would argue, the primary function of government, responsible government, to keep its citizens safe. And in this respect, it has undoubtedly informed Israel's uh, objectives uh, in this operation of, of iron swords. Uh, they have been stated from the outset as the destruction of Hamas to prevent it from ever having the capability of uh, conducting another the 7th of October. And this is in circumstances, of course, where the Hamas leadership have said over and over again that they wish uh, to commit the 7th of October over and over again, that this was just the beginning. Um, and in that context, that has been a, a one of the two key aims to prevent that from ever happening. Um, the other key aim, of course, has been the return of the hostages. And that is uh, equally about keeping Israeli citizens safe um, to the extent that that can be achieved. Uh, the dialogue and the discussion since the uh, violation of the ceasefire by Hamas on Friday last week, um, that is focused around applying military pressure to Hamas in order to seek uh, the further release of hostages uh, as uh, matters reach an impasse uh, before, of course, Hamas fired in violation of, of the ceasefire agreement. So um, the requirement uh, the responsibility of government to protect its citizens informs all of Israel's actions in this case. When one considers Hamas as a, as a government of sorts, it is responsible for the, the Palestinian Arabs living in Gaza. Uh, that is, uh, unfortunately, the opposite of their aims. Uh, they have clearly stated their aims as being the destruction of, of Israel uh, and the murder of, of Jewish people. And they use uh, their civilians to further their aims. Um, and rather than protecting them, what is being taught uh, generation after generation is unfortunately uh, that the highest calling in life is to uh, become a martyr. And so they celebrate the creation of so-called martyrs. Uh, and and uh, by recent accounts, of course, um, it's impossible to know what the casualty figures truly are, but there's been in the last few days, quite a bit of analysis that indicates that the figures coming out of the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health uh, are far from accurate. Um, I should also qualify uh, even those figures by saying that there are two additional key factors uh, that Hamas uh, is not providing information on. Uh, the first, of course, is what percentage of the casualty figures that it is putting out are Hamas combatants or other Palestinian terror organization members, and how many are civilians. Uh, they're simply putting out global figures. And the other key part of the uh, information, the missing part of the puzzle here, is how these people uh, uh, purportedly died. Because one of the key issues uh, that has been clear also from mm -hmm. previous conflicts that is utterly left out of the discussion here, but for the discussion around the Al-Akhli hospital car park strike 
because that was proven to be a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that fell short. Um, more broadly, what is missing from the discussion is an acknowledgement of all of the other missiles that are being fired out of the Gaza Strip towards Israeli civilians that are equally falling short from both Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. We don't know the figures on those as yet, and we certainly don't know how many uh, civilians have uh, been killed as a result of those missiles falling indiscriminately. Because, of course, we recognize that while Israel does have defenses in place, it has Iron Dome and it provides shelters for its civilian population. Hamas does the opposite. Uh, and there is no protection uh, of um, uh, Hamas, uh, of Gaza civilians from Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, unlike Israeli strikes, they come without warning. Mm -hmm. Um, can you um, allow me to be a devil's advocate for a bit? With pleasure. Um, okay. how, um, how does one eradicate um, a, a theological nationalistic idea such as Hamas? Can it be eradicated through warfare? Um, or do you think that it will take on... Um, a life form of its own after the war where they will hide behind this victimology. Um, and, you know, their, their, their videos of their martyrs and their civilian casualties. So, so in a word, uh, no, one cannot eradicate this ideology uh, purely through um, military means. Uh, it's important, though, perhaps before I go on to, to talk about how one does it, um, just to to recognise the, um, the the fallacy in this suggestion, which I've also heard um, repeatedly, that Israel's actions are, are simply um, creating a standard bearer for Hamas, are, are encouraging more support. I think it's plain that we've seen the opposite. Um, on the ground in the Gaza Strip. Occasionally we are seeing videos uh, of those who are very critical of what Hamas has caused, what Hamas started in th the context of this war, but also of Hamas's tactics in terms of using its uh, civilian population as human shields, shooting fleeing civilians, uh, preventing them from leaving uh, areas that Israel is targeting, mm -hmm. uh, and also bombing uh, those civilian convoys in, in the early weeks of this war uh, while they were, were seeking to follow Israeli uh, recommendations and, and uh, evacuate to the south. So I think one is already starting to see a, a turn in terms of uh, support for Hamas. Uh, but plainly, there remains a great deal of support for Hamas, not just in the Gaza Strip, but also very worryingly in the West Bank in terms of uh, recent polls uh, putting well over, well over 50%, uh, some 70 to 80% um, of popular support for what happened on the 7th of October uh, in the areas uh, that are under the Palestinian Authority control, the so-called moderates in this equation. But if we step back for a moment and consider, you know, what is it if it's not Israel's conduct uh, that is uh, radicalizing these, these people? Uh, what is it? because you do not have 3,000 people uh, who spontaneously wake up one morning and decide that it's a, a good day to slaughter Jews. That simply doesn't happen as, as a matter of, of rational common sense. That uh, happens, and these were individuals from Hamas, from Palestinian Islamic Jihad, from Fatah, mm -hmm. uh, the PFLP, the affiliates of the of the PLO uh, and the mo so the so called moderates in the West Bank. These people have been subject to thirty years of brainwashing and indoctrination, believing that the highest calling in life is to be a martyr, uh, and mm -hmm. understanding that their role. Uh, exalting martyrdom and understanding that their role is to slaughter as many Jews as possible. And this has been as a result of Palestinian Authority control over the education system, over the curriculum. It has uh, manifested itself in textbooks, in children's TV programs, in um, football associations that are named after martyrs, in mathematical problems that involve calculating uh, how many martyrs uh, in each different scenario. Uh, and one has, uh, I think, 
I mean, none of this is a surprise. Let, let me just be clear that this has been the subject of many reports from NGOs, Impact SE with respect to textbooks, uh, NGO Monitor uh, with respect to uh, much of the, of the curriculum and the funding, the international funding of this uh, curricula. In UN-run schools, UNRWA-run schools, according to UN statistics, about three out of four of the terrorists that cross the border on the 7th of October were educated in the UNRWA school system. And that must give us pause for thought because it is not Israel that is driving uh, this incitement uh, and uh, hatred. Uh, it is the international community and the support that has been given, financial and otherwise, to this infrastructure. And one has to recognize that where uh, hate is sown, war is reaped. And you cannot, absolutely cannot, contend with uh, that ideology without an acknowledgement of it. In terms of proposals for the day after this war, they are, of course, uh, still very much in development. Uh, but those that I have seen uh, uh, promulgated have all involved a concept of denazification, borrowing from uh, the aftermath of the Second World War uh, and in conjunction with you know, the Marshall Plan-like uh, initiatives to build an economy, but uh, all recognising that the denazification, that the um, wholesale reform of the Palestinian education system is key. And that education system goes hand in hand with another very, very troubling uh, aspect of this, uh, incitement and incentivization to terror, which is also supported by the international community. And that is the Palestinian pay for slay policy. This is a uh, matter of Palestinian law, enshrined in law, whereby the salaries of terrorists are paid according to the severity of their crimes, so how many Jews they have managed to slaughter. Uh, and those salaries, um, I'll give you an example. Ali Kadi, one of the uh, leaders of the uh, Nuhbach force who uh, planned the 7th of October attacks over a period of some two years, he was released in the 2011 Gilad Shalit deal. He's been paid a salary uh, including since his release by the Palestinian Authority, which by all accounts allowed him the uh, luxury of time to be able to plan uh, and then orchestrate uh, the 7th of October attacks. And this is uh, another matter which, if um, the ideology is truly going to be dealt with, if the threat that Hamas and other Palestinian terror organizations pose to Jews, not just in Israel, but around the world, and pose to Western liberal democratic values, if that is going to be properly grappled with, then we need to address education and we need to address the terror salaries which continue to be paid. Right, right. Um, there have been a, a tremendous um, number of pieces of legislation, um, some of which have, have actually unfortunately not gotten anywhere here in the United States that have been bogged down by political infighting about um, stopping um, this these UNRWA um, textbooks from promulgating um, the, um, you know, ex extolling martyrdom, um, these mathematical problems about dead Jews, et cetera. Um, but we, we have to see um, if we can get that passed. There's also a very um, ill wind that's blowing out of the U.S. State Department right now where they want a contiguous Palestinian state stress, stretching from Gaza to through um, the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, if you will, with East Jerusalem as its capital. Um, and that's while there have been these Berzit polls that you mentioned, um, which... Actually, one of them was very disturbing where they said 89% um, wants the um, Martyrs Brigade, um, the Al-Quds Brigade of Hamas um, to be in power. Um, so can you comment on um, number one, um, I think there have been attempts to stop the UNRWA funding in Europe. Um, and um, number two, um, 
your feelings about um, inserting a Mahmoud Abbas as the leader or another figure from the Palestinian Authority as the leader of Gaza after this war is over? Um, well, what Israel has made clear thus far is that uh, there will have to be some form of uh, Israeli security assurance, uh, most likely a presence uh, in the Gaza Strip. Um, because uh, it is plain that when Israel withdrew in 2005 under international pressure, uh, the promises uh, by the international community and and, and also the expectation uh, that this would become a, a Singapore um, were uh, disbelieved by, by by many, I'm bound to say, and, and, and plainly proven to be false. Uh, one cannot snap one's fingers and uh, expect democracy overnight. And actually, I, I remember in the context of the first elections that were held in 2006, I remember a BBC reporter interviewing um, ordinary um, civ civilians uh, in the cafes of, of Gaza City in advance of the election um, and asking one gentleman uh, how he would be voting. And his response was that uh, he and his six sons would be voting for Hamas. I remember that six sons was, was mm -hmm. quite, quite a number to have. Um, but when the um, reporter uh, uh, sort of moved on and, and didn't ask him how, uh, with a few weeks still to go to the election, did he know how he's, uh, all of his six sons would necessarily be voting, I think he missed a trick. Um, and I think it was in, extremely indicative of um, how, uh, unfortunately, that society still worked and the journey that had to be undertaken before real democracy could possibly take hold. And of course, we see the same in, in the West Bank, uh, in that Mahmoud Abbas is in his 18th year of a four-year term. And the only thing preventing a Hamas takeover in the West Bank, uh, as they took over in the Gaza Strip violently in 2007, uh, after the elections in 2006, the only thing uh, preventing uh, Hamas from taking over the West Bank and, and throwing their Fatah opposition members off of the roofs of buildings, as they did in Gaza. Um, the only thing preventing that is an Israeli security uh, presence uh, and Israeli security cooperation with the Palestinian Authority at the moment. It's extremely troubling, extremely troubling that after what we have seen over the last two months, uh, we would not only be seeing calls uh, emanating, uh, some of them from the United States, for Mahmoud Abbas uh, to be uh, given control of, of the Gaza Strip, but also uh, that these calls for a two-state solution are continuing. I cannot see how well the 7th of October remains within living memory. Any Israeli government can actively advance a prospect of a two-state solution. When one is faced with the inevitability of, of a terror state on one's border, and of course, Israel has a, has a history of not learning from history. Uh, has a, uh, the Israeli people, I think, have a, a unique ability uh, to advance on the basis of hope uh, and trust and a desperate, desperate uh, belief that peace is achievable. And the uh, consistent um, concessions, security concessions, uh, and very hard choices that have been made in pursuit of peace uh, are clearly testament to that. But even that goodwill, optimism, mm -hmm. and desire uh, to advance positively with one's neighbours is going to ultimately have taken a battering in light of what has happened, not least because the communities around the south of Gaza uh, were those that were most actively involved in seeking positive cooperation, uh, in seeking uh, economic links. Um, there were also, of course, uh, it's an important number to remember, between January and August of this year, there were over 400,000 entrances from Gaza into Israel, mostly on work permits. And these saw uh, individuals from Gaza uh, often coming to work in the communities uh, around the border area in the south of Israel, those that were attacked ultimately. Uh, and it's become clear investigation subsequently in terms of the material that was found on many of the terrorists that infiltrated on the 7th of October. This included detailed plans 
um, that listed individuals, household by household, how many children, whether there was a dog, whether there was a gun in the house, and often detailed instructions of what the terrorists were to do to each family. Uh, plainly uh, um, put together on the basis of uh, the evidence and intelligence that was gathered um, by virtue of these work permits. So in that context, again, I've, I've not seen this discussed on uh, on international media, uh, but it, it is a horrifying factor that the Israeli public has certainly mm -hmm. internalized. Uh, and in that context, uh, the suggestion that matters can simply pick up from where they left off uh, is not credible. Uh, it's not workable, and it's extremely concerning uh, that one hears um, proposals or propositions in the international community that are, are so far off the mark. This is unfortunately not new. And if I can give one example, um, I think it's a, a telling instinct, uh, in, uh, in a, a telling instance <clears throat> of where um, international pressure has been pushing peace further away rather than bringing it closer. And I'm particularly reminded of a remark by Mahmoud Abbas um, several administrations ago in respect of uh, President Obama's policy on Israeli settlements when he was calling for a moratorium uh, on settlement building and when he uh, appeared to be blaming the settlements uh, for everything that was wrong with the uh, failing peace process. And Mahmoud Abbas said, how can I be less Palestinian than the President of the United States? And what he meant by that was that he could not go to a negotiating table uh, and ask for anything less than was being demanded on his behalf by the President of the United States. He could far less leave a negotiating table, having achieved uh, anything less than was being demanded on his behalf by the US. And in the context where, and let's be clear about what that demand ultimately was, it was coming from a position that Jews shouldn't be allowed to live in certain areas simply because they are Jews. Right? This idea that uh, a, a Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria is illegitimate. Uh, now, that ultimately, of course, does uh, chime with the Palestinian Authority's demand that the West Bank be Judenrein, but it is not um, realistic. Uh, and it certainly wasn't realistic in the context in which uh, any negotiations might have progressed in uh, in the time that, uh, that Mahmoud Abbas uh, uttered these words. And it is a strong indication uh, that um, uninformed and deeply, deeply problematic positions being taken by uh, international actors, in many respects, allies of Israel, uh, has the opposite effect of advancing uh, peace. I come back to uh, a point that we discussed earlier on, which is that the crux of this, at the center of this, is education. I've visited Ramallah on a number of occasions, and I've been extremely encouraged uh, when I venture, visited um, venture capital startup funds looking to create Silicon Valley in the Middle East, um, in, in Ramallah, uh, looking to create uh, economic links with the Israeli uh, startup world mm -hmm. and provide economic incentives, create a Palestinian middle class with a stake in society, one that would ultimately reject their current mm -hmm. leadership that has not been serving their interests. But that can only properly proceed uh, where the next generation is not educated uh, to hatred in the fashion that it is currently, unfortunately, being subject to. Right. Um, I'm reminded of a quote by John F. Kennedy that peace does not exist in signed documents and charters alone, but in the hearts and minds of the children. Um, so we, we really... See mm, we see that with the Abraham Accord. Right, right, um, right, right. And therein, if I may be permitted just another uh, another right. example, and far be it for me to, to to sound in any way like I'm America bashing. I'm um, I'm a big fan of the United States, and um, I certainly look forward to uh, continued U.S. leadership and promoting uh, freedom uh, around the world. But uh, I'm also reminded of uh, Secretary of State Kerry's remarks at the Saban conference. I think it was in 2016. Mark my words, he said something along these lines. There will never be. Uh, a separate peace between Israel and the Arab world without a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, paraphrasing slightly. 
that's more or less what it was, how wrong he was and how wrong he was proven to be with the Abraham Accords. And that, I think, also goes to show that um, what is uh, the received wisdom, especially uh, vis-a-vis the Israeli-Arab conflict, is um, oftentimes uh, extremely misplaced and very, very damaging uh, because it was plain, I think, to many already in 2016 uh, because of that heart-to-heart, people-to-people engagement um, between Israelis and 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 the um, you know citizens of, of of many of those Abraham Accords countries uh, that peace was achievable and that was being strived for for many many years by successive Israeli governments and ultimately that proved to be successful. So um, before I turn to my wonderful colleague, Joseph Epstein, who's going to read some of the questions that have come in, um, Natasha, you believe deeply that October 7th did usher in a sea change where um, foreign policy will be predicated on sober realism rather than hope and wishful thinking, at least among the Israelis, right? I I, I hope so. I anticipate that um, it seems to me the only logical conclusion, um, but uh, I'm, um, you know, also aware that that I may yet be proved wrong. I was in Israel over the last few days. Um, I was extremely um, well. The, the the resilience and the strength of that country left an indelible impression on me in my recent visit, uh, and that does appear to me to have gone hand in hand with uh with with the the, the real realism uh and the acknowledgement of what uh, Israel is dealing with and Israel is uh, having to contend with not just in respect to the 7th of October uh, we haven't talked to, yet about the geopolitical context here but of course um one of the reasons that Israel's robust response and its completion of its aims um vis-a-vis Hamas are so important is because the rest of the Arab world is watching very closely, including uh, those uh, entities that that have yet to make peace uh, with Israel. Um, Hezbollah on the border, another Iranian proxy, um, is uh, already attacking, of course, the northern and southern communities along the borders that Israel shares with terror organizations have had to be evacuated. Uh, And um, I think the Arab world more generally is keeping a very close eye. And so Israel's actions are not just critical vis-a-vis Hamas, but critical vis-a-vis the other threats that it is facing from the region. Wonderful. And now I'm turning the podium over to Joseph, who will read some of the questions that have come in. Joseph? Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Natasha. This has been a very insightful presentation. So I'd like now to turn to questions that we have received so far from the Q&A function. So the first one was, uh, could you please discuss how the IDF's decisions regarding when to strike or not have changed in this war uh, versus past engagements in Gaza? As um, apparently there have been sources that have saying that the rules of engagement have been loosened and put lower in the change of and in the chain of command. Okay. Um, I can't answer that question because the rules of engagement are not made public and for good reason. Uh, that, um, you know, if they were, then Hamas would adopt its practices uh, in order to uh, seek to thwart Israeli efforts and, and be better informed in doing so in that regard. The reason I referred to previous operations is because after the event, there has been the opportunity to investigate, uh, and uh, that has been done internally in Israel and, and also uh, by uh, bodies outside of Israel uh, and independent bodies like the high-level military group that I referenced earlier. Um, and the reason I think that that track record and that past practice is important is because it speaks to more than just what Israel did um, in those previous uh, uh, operations. It speaks to the approach that the IDF takes uh, more generally and um, the ethical uh, approach uh, that is em- embraced. Um, and in that respect, uh, although, of course, this conflict is different because the military objectives are different, you know, Israel has never previously said it will uh, destroy Hamas entirely it will dismantle its ability to conduct any operations from the Gaza Strip. Um, That has never been part of the previous aims. Many argue it should have been, Uh, but uh, the uh, leeway 
that Israel was afforded by the international community in previous conflicts uh, was was very much more restricted. And we can also perhaps talk about uh, international responsibility in that regard for what happened on the 7th of October. Uh, But here, uh, while the challenge is different and while the approaches are are different, um, there are strong indicators that Israel's approach, uh, generally speaking, uh, is still consistently above the requirements of international law. And we see that from uh, the steps taken to evacuate civilians to provide warnings as to strikes, but also critically from the ground operation. Um, Israel has uh, superior air power. uh, And uh, if proportionality wasn't an issue, if civilian collateral damage wasn't an issue, uh, then this war would have been over a long time ago. And it might not have involved Israeli forces going in on the ground. I say that with some, uh, you know, I say might not, because, of course, the, the tunnel situation is a is a particularly difficult challenge. And some of them, by all account, accounts, are not uh, reachable uh, by aerial bombardment because they are built so very, very far underground. And 300 miles of terror tunnels uh, does need to be addressed by Israel. Um, in in pursuit of its aim against Hamas. Uh, But the fact that we have uh, troops going in on the ground, and I'll give you the example of the hospitals, and Al-Shifa Hospital in particular, um, sending uh, Israeli special forces into the hospital, uh, as Reuters reported, with Arabic speakers and medical uh, staff, um, in order to assist the differentiation between Hamas terror operatives and the sick, injured, doctors, nurses, medical staff, Uh, that is indicative of Israel maintaining uh, the highest standards required by uh, the international law of armed conflict in terms of proportionality, also, of course, in terms of distinction, differentiating between civilians and combatants, and and maintaining uh, uh, also a high, uh, the the other principle, I'm not sure we've mentioned it yet, uh, out of the, the three main, we've got distinction, proportionality and necessity. So Israel is acting out of military necessity. It is not gratuitously attacking uh, any any targets in Gaza. It is going after the terror infrastructure where that is necessary for the achievement uh, for achieving its its military objectives. Thank you so much, Natasha. So our next question has to do with Egypt. What are Egypt's obligations, or does it have any under international law to allow refugees in from Gaza? or to in any way somehow ease the situation? Um, It has a very important obligation under international law, uh, which no one, but no one I I have heard discussing. uh, And that is under a treaty of the African Union uh, that I'm about to open up so that I do not uh, get its name wrong. The convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa. Egypt, acceded to that treaty in 1980. And it's important because that treaty incorporates a definition of refugee, which is far broader than the uh, Refugee Convention. Uh, And it includes, uh, this is Article 2, this is, forgive me, this is Article 1, Paragraph 2, uh, where it states, the term refugee shall also apply to every person who Uh, owing to external aggression, occupation, foreign uh, domination, or events seriously disrupting public order in either part or whole of his country of origin or nationality, is compelled to leave his place of habitual residence in order to seek refuge in another place outside of his country of origin or nationality. So absent that convention, if you were to ask me, does Egypt have a responsibility to open its borders to refugees uh, in the uh, sort of classical sense, those fleeing persecution, um, asylum seekers, uh, I, I would I would say yes in, in respect of um, those fleeing persecution, but unfortunately, those fleeing a conflict or serious disruption to public order uh, would not qualify. But in Egypt's case, we have a local treaty that it is a, uh, a bound by, that it has decided to bind itself by already in, in 1980. Um, and its obligations under that are clear. Uh, the fact that we have not heard any clamour in the international community for Egypt to comply with those obligations uh, and facilitate 
the uh, evacuation of civilians from Gaza across the border into Rafa on the Egyptian side, where they uh, might um, very understandably be better provided for in terms of humanitarian assistance, because critically, Hamas would not be able to divert humanitarian aid provided to uh, Palestinian citizens on the other side of the border if they were permitted into Egypt. So there are many reasons to be calling on Egypt uh, to comply with its international law obligations. And it's extremely troubling uh, that we've not heard that from any uh, authoritative quarter uh, internationally. That actually brings me to my next question, which is another question from the audience, which is, why do you think there has been a lack of pressure on Egypt, as well as even Jordan, um, to take in Gazans, uh, Palestinians, so that Israel can deal with Hamas without them being a human shield? I think there are many layers uh, to to the analysis on, on that. Um, and I have to stress, I mean, this is uh, th this is informed, I suppose, by by my own reading and and twenty odd years of of, of following mm -hmm. um, the uh, international relations in that part of the world closely. Plainly, uh, Egypt is understandably fearful of the Muslim Brotherhood um, it, within Egypt itself, and of course, uh, uh, Hamas is is part of that, and uh, their treatment of Hamas mm -hmm. and and of Gaza, mm -hmm. um, of course, has been. Uh, reprehensible. Um, they have, unlike Israel, that has been providing uh, resources uh, across the border until uh, the 7th of October, when so much of that infrastructure uh, that Israel was providing electricity and water with was actually attacked by Hamas uh, and destroyed because uh, the, the the pipes and um, and uh, electricity uh, just running through the communities on the south that, that Hamas attacked. Uh, so in com contrast to uh, Israel's support uh, of the uh, citizenry of Gaza, uh, Egypt has uh, policed its border robustly and has taken lethal action uh, along that border uh, where it, it felt it was justified. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't we seeing uh, so that that's why of course you know there's an understandable uh, assessment um by those who understand egypt's position that that would put egypt in a difficult position um and that egypt would be reluctant uh, but that doesn't really explain why for instance the united states with all of the the billions that they support the egyptians with uh, wouldn't think it sensible to use that leverage in a way that would would plainly save Palestinian lives in this uh, you know, horrific context. When we come to the wider Arab world, um, we have seen a call uh, that um, no Palestinian should be permitted to leave Gaza because they uh, object to what they call a, a displacement, uh, in some quarters referenced a, a second Nakba. Now, in that context, of course, we would have to analyse exactly what is meant by by the first Nakba. We probably don't have time on this call uh, mm -hmm. to, to go into the details of, of 1948 and, and the deep, deep misrepresentations, uh, which, of course, over the last 75 odd years have, have taken root with respect to, to what happened in 1948. Um, but it's very important that we don't see similar misrepresentations here. You know, an evacuation of civilians across uh, the border. Uh, from where Hamas is using them as, civil, as civ civilian human shields, uh, is intended to save their lives. Um, and Israel's requests, recommendations uh, that they uh, evacuate on that basis have uh, unfortunately also been utterly misrepresented mm -hmm. as an attempt uh, to displace. So I think that um, narrative, which has taken it's hold taken of the whole world, is... Uh, is plainly playing a role uh, in the reluctance of many international actors uh, to call out Egypt's uh, own violations of its international law obligations. Thank you so much, Natasha. It seems that we are unfortunately out of time. So I would like to thank you again for this amazing presentation. I'd also like to thank our audience uh, for showing up. You guys are the backbone of Emet. And if you feel that this webinar was informative and you liked it, please consider giving a meta donation. Thank you so much.